Okay, welcome back to members of 121 Community Church in Grapevine, Texas, and our ongoing study in Church Dogmatics by Emil Bruner. We're into Volume 2 now in the Doctrine of Creation, and uh, now we take a look at the purpose of creation. It'll be pages 13 to 23, and uh, it's well done. It's really well done. Uh, uh, we've come to expect that from Bruner, but let's go to Block 1. Okay, creation's eschatological purpose, objective purpose. Creation has an ideal aspect as a divine omnipotence and agape, and especially as divine self-communication, as incarnate doxa glory. And it is to be received in freedom. So the subjective side is the fact that we receive this purpose in freedom, and, and we reflect back the doxa glory, knowing that agape is God's final cause. And we know that because it is revealed in Christ. The Old Testament does not contain this aspect except only as prophetic anticipation. Therefore, this is key. The New Testament is our starting point for the doctrine of creation. Not Genesis, it's the New Testament. The New Testament is our starting point for a doctrine of creation. So we begin with it we begin with the New Testament witness. Messianic covenant is the foundation of creation. Anticipated in the prophetic writings as word becoming flesh. Revealing agape, revealing grace. And agape and grace become the divine purpose of creation. So note four, the purpose of creation. Again, we negate Neoplatonic rationalism and the idea of a co-eternal world. We affirm personalism. We affirm a personal God. And the paradox that time has a beginning. Time and space are created by God according to the revelatory witness. Time and space are created by God. And again, you can see that uh, Brunner emphasizes personalism. We affirm a personal God. God as subject. Let's go on to block two. Okay, block two. Now we're going to talk about, uh, block one gave us the eschatological purpose, but block two, now there is also uh, the independence of, co of creation. We negate uh, pessimism, we negate optimism. Overly pessimistic view comes from Gnosticism that posited the world as entirely negative. The overly optimistic view came from uh, Neoplatonic emanation theory, that uh, the world was almost equated with the divine. Both of those extremes we negate. We affirm the New Testament witness. The structure of the world is created by God. The constitution of man is created by God. But the power of sin does exist in the world, and the sway of sin rules over the world. Even so, creation is affirmed affirmed as good. Creation is, and I would put in front of that, creation is eschatologically affirmed as good. I'd go back to block one there, so eschatologically affirmed as good. We affirm the independence of creation. God created something other than himself by, now get this, because Moltmann picked up on this, by making room for this otherness to exist. Where? Within God's self. By making room for this otherness to exist within God's self. Because all there was, was God. In the beginning, God. Nothing can exist outside of God. So, by making room for this otherness, otherness to exist within the Godhead. It does not stand in opposition to God, 
God wills this otherness. Now, Moltmann picked up on that. Uh, I'll guarantee you, he talked about that uh, a great deal. That the first act of creation was the act of love in making room for creation to exist in the first place. In other words, the act of creation itself was an act of self-sacrificial love. In other words, it was a, an act, creation itself was an act of agape. Creation itself was an act of agape. Now, in this particular lesson, Brunner closes out with the self as the image of God. Echo block three as analogy or parable of being. Creation is limited and dependent being. But the self possesses a resemblance to the creator. The self, in the self, God makes manifest his power and his sovereign destiny. The divine power and the divine destiny are revelatory. The order of creation testifies to God's planning thought. Life reflects God's spirit. Within the mystery of organic life, says Brunner, which reveals creative eschatological planning, including a self created as image of God. That's part of the eschatological plan. The creating the self as image of God is part of that eschatological plan. I think that makes perfect sense. I, uh, I think that makes revelatory sense, if you want to put it that way. Part of the eschatological coming into being is to create selves, personhoods, human beings that reflect the image of God. So 3.3, three, the, the self as the image of God. Uh, and it is so by possessing freedom in creation and by possessing a speech and personhood as a parable of similarity. We negate any Neoplatonic rationalism. We affirm the revelatory truth that self bears an imprint of spirit. We are spirit, okay? We are spirit, and we are currently uh, alive in this uh, classroom called a physical body of flesh and bone. And it's a classroom because we are here to learn, to learn dependence on our creator, to learn worship and obedience and dependence on our creator. So we, we are spirit and we are created as spirit, but we are currently housed in this body of flesh and bone, but uh, we are spirit. And I firmly believe that, and I think it's a shame that uh, so many don't recognize that. But by the grace of God through Christ, there is a small remnant that does realize we are imprinted with divine spirit in the very act of creation itself. Revealed in the ideas of word and person, revelatory personalism reveals our similarity to God as subject. What does neo-orthodoxy posit? The foundational truth is God as subject. God as triune personhood. God as triune personhood. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All three personhoods. And we resemble, we bear this image of God because of the faculties of Freedom, speech, and personhood. Freedom, speech, and personhood. So let's do a quick uh, little recap just to close out. And we'll begin with block one, the eschatological purpose of creation. And uh, I guess let's go to note four. We negate Neoplatonic rationalism. We negate the idea of a co-eternal world, and we affirm personalism. We affirm God as subject, 
and we affirm the neo-orthodox paradox, the revelatory paradox, that time has a beginning. Time and space are created by God as subject, God as self-sacrificial subject. Now, block two, uh, it's got to be note three because it talks about that making room. And that uh, that is the first act of creation. Room had to be made for creation to even take place. And nothing can exist outside God. There's no life outside God. So let's go to three in block two. God created something other than himself by making room for this otherness to exist. It does not stand in opposition to God. God wills this otherness. God wills to make himself manifest toward this created otherness. And I just love that, uh, the fact that uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, Moltmann, like I said, we never discussed Brunner, but I guess we should have. <laughs> I guess we should have. But uh, definitely, this is exactly what Moltmann picked up on in the neo-Orthodox tradition. This making room for creation was the first sacrificial act of creation by our creator. Now, block three, it's got to be note three, the self as the image of God, by possessing freedom in creation, and by possessing speech, and by possessing personhood. We are a parable of similarity. We negate any Neoplatonic rationalism. We affirm the truth that the self bears the imprint, the deep foundational imprint of spirit. I believe that with all my heart. This body of flesh and blood, flesh, blood, and bone, it's a schoolhouse. We are here to learn what? We are here to learn of our Father, and I say Father because Christ revealed that we can call him Father, our Father Creator. We are to learn absolute dependence on our Father Creator. That's it. We are to learn a absolute dependence on our Father Creator through the sacrifice of Christ. Because we are spirit. This body we currently exist in, it is a, a schoolhouse. It's the current place of learning. And we are to learn about our Father in heaven. So we have a great uh, second lesson here. I really do appreciate Brunner more and more and more. The more that I study him, the more I go, yes, I wish I would have studied him years ago. Here I am late in my life. I'm just now digging into Brunner in depth. But I absolutely agree with the fact that uh, there is an eschatological purpose, a coming into being of creation, and that it does possess an independence that has been given to it by the Creator, and that we are those who bear image of God. We are those who are imprinted to the very core of our being, imprinted of spirit. And that uh, that's so critical, because what is our task? To reflect back the glory of God within the realm of spirit. To not only perceive the realm of spirit, but we are to participate in the realm of spirit. Well, how can we participate in the realm of spirit? It's because we bear the imprint of spirit. And it is awakened and strengthened and empowered through Christ, the Savior mediator. And then we are able to, by the grace of God, by the gift of grace in Christ, we are able to participate in the realm of spirit and to truly visualize the realm of spirit that so many ignore. The vast majority ignore the realm of spirit. But there is a small, very small percentage, there is a very small remnant who have been gifted with 
the ability to perceive the realm of spirit, and better yet, to participate in the realm of spirit. That's going to wrap up pages 13 to 23. We will conclude chapter 1 next time. Pages 24 to 36 next time. We'll conclude chapter 1. That wraps up 13 to 23.